Chapter 14. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to be covering conjugation, resonance, and dienes. And so we want to discuss uh, these topics in this chapter. So we're going to start with what is conjugation? Well, conjugation occurs anytime that you can have p orbitals that can overlap on three or more adjacent atoms. As an example, we have 1,3-diene, uh, so butadiene, 1,3-diene, uh, and uh, an allylic carbocation. Those are a couple of examples of this. Um, on the butadiene, and I'm going to show, I'm going to show a, uh, a quick example of what this looks like. So here is a molecular model of a 1,3-butadiene. We have a pi bond in between carbons 1 and carbon 2. We have a pi bond between carbon 3 and carbon 4. And since they are directly adjacent to each other, we get some overlap of these pi systems. As a result, we get a little bit of pi bond character in between carbon 2 and carbon 3. And we'll talk about how that works here in just a moment. So uh, there are four... Uh, uh, the four p orbitals that are on the carbons in the 1,3-diene system, they overlap. And, uh, and because they overlap, we get an extended pi system. So we want to be able to identify what is a conjugated system and what is not a conjugated system. So we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at delocalization. Uh, in order to have delocalization, we need to have three or more p orbitals on adjacent carbon atoms, and they must be adjacent in order for delocalization to occur. So um, the 1,3-butadiene system that we talked about before meets these requirements. All four carbons are sp2 hybridized, so they all have p orbitals, and those p orbitals are all capable of overlapping. So we want to differentiate between what we refer to as a conjugated diene versus an isolated diene. In a conjugated diene, um, again, all of our carbon atoms and our, all of the pi bonds are capable of overlapping with each other because they are all sp2 hybridized. So in the example of 1,3-butadiene, we've got uh, a pi bond between carbons 1 and 2 and between 3 and 4 and that allows uh, that allows the the pi bonds to overlap um, in between carbons 2 and 3. In our pentaf 1,4 diene it's an isolated diene and uh, we'll find that the uh, pi bond here and the pi bond there are not conjugated because uh, there is an sp3 hybridized carbon in between uh, carbon 2 and carbon 4. So, uh, so there, it makes it so it is not possible for those pi bonds to overlap. So we say that these pi bonds are localized, whereas the pi bonds in the conjugated system are delocalized. If we take these two compounds and look at an electrostatic potential plot for um, the two dienes. In the butadiene, the uh, conjugated system, we'll see that there is an electron-rich region that stretches all the way from carbon 1 to carbon 4. So we don't have a localized pi bond on carbon uh, between carbons 1 and 2 and between 3 and 4. We have a pi system that stretches out across all four carbons. Whereas if we look at the isolated, uh, the isolated diene, the uh, penta 1,4 diene, uh, we'll see that the electron density is isolated between carbons 1 and 2 and between carbons 4 and 5. And that's because we have this sp3 hybridized carbon in between, and that makes it so that the p orbitals are not capable of overlapping. So... Um, in the other system that I mentioned a little bit earlier was the allylic system. Now, we've looked at allylic radicals. 
um, and we will look at, uh, we have allylic carbocations here. Later in the semester, we're going to talk about allylic carbo carbanions, so uh, negatively charged par um, um, conjugated systems, but um, they all work pretty much the same. Uh, the allylic carbocation is conjugated, and you can tell because uh, we have three sp2 hybridized carbons. They all have a p orbital, and the electrons, the pi electrons, are delocalized over all three atoms. So anytime you have three or more adjacent p orbitals that can overlap, it's a conjugated system. We'll find that conjugation provides stability. So the allylic uh, carbocation is more stable than a typical primary carbocation. And we'll talk about that stability in just a few minutes. But the most important feature is that we get the overlap of adjacent p orbitals. So what we want to do now is we want to look at number three on the in-class assignment. And we want to determine, are these conjugated systems or uh, not conjugated systems? And again, all we have to do is look, do we have adjacent pi bonds or adjacent p orbitals? Here we've got a pi bond between carbon one and two, between three and four, and between five and six. This is definitely a conjugated system. If we look at B, on B, we've got a pi bond here, but then there's an sp3 hybridized carbon there, and uh, a pi bond here, but there's an sp3 hybridized carbon there, and a pi bond there. So the, this is not conjugated. It would be uh, an isolated. This is an isolated triene, but it's an isolated system, so not conjugated. All right, here we've got this... Uh, We've got this ketone, we, so we've got a carbon-oxygen carbon double bond there, and a carbon-carbon double bond here, and because, uh, because they are directly adjacent to each other, this is conjugated. All right. Here we've got uh, a carbon-carbon double bond, and directly adjacent to that, we've got a carbocation. And because we've got a carbocation there, this uh, has a p orbital, so this is conjugated. All right, on this one here, we've got a pi bond, but you'll see that there is, uh, we do have the, the carbocation over here, but we have, we have an sp3 hybridized carbon here in between. And so this is not conjugated, it is isolated. All right, and on this one, uh, I don't know if you can see these clearly, but hopefully you can see them on yours. We've got a double bond between carbons one and two, a double bond between three and four, and a double bond between f carbons five and six. And so all of those carbons are sp2 hybridized. They all have p orbitals, and they will all overlap. So this is also conjugated. That's our conjugated system. All right, so we want to look at the resonance structures and then draw the hybrid structures for a few of these compounds. By drawing the resonance structures, we can get, uh, by drawing the resonance structures, we can get information about uh, what the hybrid is going to look like. Recall, when we have a hybrid, the hybrid is going to look like a mixture of the different resonance structures. So here we've got our allylic carbocation, and if we draw the resonance structure by moving that pair of electrons over, we have this other resonance structure of the allylic carbocation. And, uh, and then if we draw the hybrid, all right, the hybrid is a combination of these, uh, and in this case it's a 50-50 combination. Sometimes it's not a perfect 50-50, but uh, in this case it is. So we have partial pi bond character between carbon one and two, partial pi bond character between carbon two and three, and then a partial positive charge on carbon one and a partial positive charge on carbon three. 
So what this does is um, a carbocation is a reactive intermediate. And uh, when you have things that are reactive, if you can take the reactive part and spread it out so that it's not, it's not isolated on one particular atom, you can stabilize that reactive intermediate. So uh, when we have a carbocation, or a, an allylic carbocation, uh, we delocalize the charge over two carbon atoms instead of having it localized on one carbon atom. So delocalizing the electron density lowers the energy and makes uh, and stabilizes our allylic carbocation. So our, uh, it's more stable than a normal primary carbocation would be. And we'll look at how much that is the case. So uh, if we look at uh, experimental data and compare how stable how stable a carbocation is, we will see that the allylic carbocation is comparable in stability to a secondary carbocation. So we know from previous chapters that the methyl carbocation is the least stable. We hardly ever observe that except in weird situations like in a mass spectrometer. Primary carbocations are also difficult to observe. Again, we can observe it in a mass spec. Secondary carbocations, we can have these happen in mechanisms. In fact, uh, a lot of the SN1 and E1 uh, mechanisms rely on having a secondary carbocation, and we will find that the allylic carbocation is comparable in stability to that secondary carbocation. If you have additional alkyl groups on there, you can make it so it's even as stable as a tertiary carbocation or even more stable. So if you have a tertiary allylic carbocation, um, that's going to be a very stable um, uh, carbocation. So we want to look at examples of resonance and we will find that there are, there are three types, I'm sorry, four types of resonance that we're going to be talking about in this chapter. And the first type is the allyl system. Now, allylic, uh, um, uh, allylic can refer to more than one thing. It, uh, it will refer to a compound that has three atoms uh, where one atom has a double bond, or two of the atoms have a double bond, and the adjacent atom has something reactive. That reactive thing can be a carbocation, so a positive charge. It can be a negative charge, as in a, uh, a, a, a pair of electrons, or it can be a radical. So a couple of examples of an allyl system are going to include the allylic carbocation. This is much like the one we start looked at here. This is an example of a secondary allylic carbocation. So it's allylic, but it's also uh, a secondary carbocation. So this is quite stable. Uh, and then over here, we've got the acetate anion. Uh, the acetate anion, that stability that the acetate anion gives us is what causes uh, carboxylic acids to be acidic. So things like, um, things like acetic acid, which is this one, or acetate, uh, which is this one, it's the conjugate base of acetic acid. Because of acetate stability, acetic acid is a pretty good acid, pKa of about 4.8. All right, our second type of resonance, so first type was allylic, our second type of resonance is when we have conjugated double bonds. And um, there's a couple of different examples that we're gonna have for this. We can have cyclic systems that are aromatic, like uh, this benzene. So the completely conjugated rings like benzene are gonna have two resonance structures. And we'll find that this has very unusual stability. In fact, we have a couple of chapters where we discuss uh, um, these kinds of systems and the reactions that they undergo. Very interesting. And those are the next two chapters. We also have the system like the 1-3-butadiene uh, one, butadiene that we referred to uh, a little bit ago. I showed you the model of the 1-3-butadiene. And we can, draw, uh, we can draw two additional resonance structures one where we move the electron density over on to carbon four and have a positive charge on carbon one, negative charge on carbon four. We can go back to our uh, butadiene structure and we draw another one 
where we have the negative charge on carbon one and a positive charge on carbon four. All of these contribute somewhat to the overall structure. The best structure is definitely the 1,3-butadiene, but because of this, there is some partial pi bond character between carbon two and carbon three. And that is conjugation, and that provides extra stability. And I'll show you how much extra stability a little bit later. But let's get to our third type of resonance. And this is where we have a cation of some sort that is immediately adjacent to an atom that has a lone pair of electrons. All right, so here is, um, here is just uh, the prototypical example. We have a lone pair of electrons on X, a positive charge on Y. We share that pair of electrons in between the, uh, the X and the Y and we get a double bond in between those and put the positive charge on X. We'll find that the overall charge is the same on both, but because we can draw this additional resonance structure, it gives us additional stability. Here is an example. Um, here is an example where we have a lone pair of electrons on oxygen, and we have the positive charge on the CH2. We can share that pair of electrons. It does put a positive charge on the oxygen, However, uh, uh, we now have a full octet on that carbon. So um, again, this gives us additional stabilization. Our fourth type of resonance uh, is the resonance that we have when we have a double bond between a carbon and some other more electronegative atom. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be carbon, it can be other atoms like sulfur. But carbon, you know, we're organic chemists here, so carbon is the one that we're typically going to be looking at. So here we've got the example where uh, we've got um, a carbon bond uh, bonded to some other atom. So here it's just X and Y, but we can take uh, uh, that pi bond in between these two atoms and kick it out to the more electronegative element. Our example here is uh, our example here is a carbonyl. Carbonyls, we can draw a resonance structure where we put the negative charge on the oxygen and we put a positive charge on the carbon. The true structure is somewhere in between where we have a partial, uh, partial pi bond in between and we've got a partial positive charge on the carbon and a partial negative charge on the oxygen. So we're now going to look at uh, drawing some additional resonance structures on problem number seven. All right. So we want to draw additional resonance structures for each of these ions. This one, we when there's two different additional resonance structures that we can draw. We can draw one where uh, we put the negative charge over here and one where we put the negative charge over there. We'll start with, it's arbitrarily, we'll start with the one where we put it over on the left. So we'll put that there and then move this to that carbon. And when we do that here, All right, and so now we've got pi bonds here and here and the negative charge on that carbon. So now we're going to draw the resonance structure uh, where we put it out on the, on the far one. We already have the one that's in the middle, so we're gonna put it onto here. And then we'll take this one and go to there. And then this will come out to that, that uh, terminal carbon. So here we'll have a pi bond there, there, and then a lone pair of electrons with a negative charge. It looks kind of like a little smiley face, uh, negative charge out there on that terminal carbon. All right. Here we've got a system where we've got a negative charge that is adjacent to a carbonyl. We're going to see this quite a bit. This is a this is called an enolate. Uh, we're going to see this quite a bit later in the chapters, later in the semester. 
Um, so there are there are electrons here that are on this carbon, uh, and we're going to take those and form a pi bond between the two carbons here, and we're going to kick these, this pair of electrons out to the oxygen. We'll take this one and go there. have a pi bond there and now our oxygen is going to have a negative charge on it so that is our other structure and we'll find that these two structures are, are, are very important and statistically are, are, are very significant um, later when we talk about enolates so all right this is the type of system where we have a positive charge that is adjacent to an atom that has a lone pair of electrons. So here, we're just gonna take one of those lone pairs of electrons and we're going to share it in between these two atoms to make a pi bond. So we'll put the arrow going to that bond. And when we do that, so here we'll have two lone pairs and there will be a positive charge out on that chlorine atom. All right, and we'll, we'll see this uh, quite a bit. All right, for this last one, this one is kind of interesting uh, because we, uh, we have what appears to be a conjugated uh, pi bond here, but it, it's a little bit complicated. So what we're going to do when you have a positive charge, you're going to move the electrons towards that positive charge. When you have a negative charge, you move uh, the, you start with the negative charge and move uh, away from where it is. But here we're going to start with the pair of electrons here, and we'll move it to there to make a new pi bond there, and that is going to leave a positive charge on this carbon. That pi bond is still there. That one is still there. But now we have a pi bond in between these two carbons and a positive charge on that carbon. Next, we're gonna take this pair of electrons and share it between these two carbons. So we'll move it here. I'll take my red pen. We're gonna share that there. And that will put a positive charge on this carbon. positive charge there and then if you attempt if you attempt to share this positive charge over here you'll find that it's really just not possible it's not possible while having the same number of unpaired electrons if we don't mind having some radicals we can do it but uh, that is not that's not what we're trying to do here so um, so we can't take this and include that pi bond if you come up with a way to do it uh, let me know but I'm pretty confident you won't be able to do that. But again, show me, I'm, I'm willing to take a look. All right, so those are the three resonance structures that we can get for this. So we now want to look more closely at resonance hybrids. We've done resonance hybrids before, um, and resonance hybrids help us to understand um, how we stabilize things. And with, uh, with conjugation, these resonance hybrids are very important. So the hybrid structure is a combination of the available resonance structures. We are going to find that some of those resonance structures are better than others, but, uh, um, but the, and the hybrid structure is going to more closely resemble the most stable resonance structure. It kind of gets the best of all the resonance structures, so that's what we like about the hybrid structure. We will find that there are a couple of rules that we can use to, to help us to determine what resonance structure is the best resonance structure. 
And our first rule is resonant structures with more bonds and fewer charges are better. So if we look at this system where we've got a carbon-oxygen double bond, the carbonyl, and we kick out the electrons to the oxygen, uh, we can do that because the oxygen is more electronegative. That is fine. Uh, but then we have a positive charge on the carbon. Well, it doesn't mean that this is a bad resonance structure. What it means is that this is a better resonance structure. We've got, uh, we've got more bonds and fewer charges. So you'll notice here there are no formal charges, and on this one there are. And on this one, we've got the more bonds. So more bonds, fewer charges is generally better. In addition to that, in, as for our second rule, our second rule is resonant structures in which every atom has an octet is better. This actually applies to the one we were just looking at. Um, um, if, we, if we go back, we'll see here that uh, the structure on the left, the carbon has a full octet right here, and the structure on the right, the carbon doesn't have a full octet. But a uh, resonant structure in which every atom has an octet is generally better. So when we look at these two structures, uh, we've got this oxygen that's adjacent to a carbocation, uh, so it's got a lone pair of electrons that we can share. Uh, here, we are going to have a full octet on carbon, and so this is a better resonance structure. Even though it puts a more, the positive charge on the more electronegative element, that's still a better resonance structure. For our third rule, we'll find that resonance structures that place a negative charge on the more electronegative atom are better. So this, if you have a negative charge on the whole, on the whole species, like, and again, this is called an enolate. Uh, if you have a negative charge on the whole thing, if you can find a way to put that negative charge onto the more electronegative element, that's generally a better resonance structure. Both of these, I, everything has a full octet. Uh, they have the same number of bonds and the same number of charges. But the big difference is we put the negative charge onto oxygen. And oxygen is a lot more electronegative than the carbon is. So we'll find that that is our better resonance structure. So now we want to compare. Uh, we want to look at number eight and do a couple of comparisons. So we're going to switch over to our document camera here. We're going to draw the additional resonance structure that uh, applies to each species. All right, here we've got a positive charge that is adjacent to a nitrogen that has a lone pair of electrons. So we're going to share that pair of electrons to make a double bond. So we'll have a double bond. That does put a positive charge on the nitrogen. Uh, and it removes it from the, the uh, carbon. And as far as determining which one is going to be our better resonance structure, we're going to use rule two. Rule two told us, if you go back and look at rule two, I'll put it up on the screen here for a second. Uh, if you look at rule two, uh, the resonance structures in which everything has an octet are better. Well, that's what applies here. On the structure on the left, the carbon does not have a full octet. But on the structure on the right, everything has a full octet. So this one is better. And it's because uh, uh, carbon has a full octet. All right. Now, um, and that means it's going to contribute more to our hybrid structure. So as far as drawing our hybrid structure, we draw everything that's exactly the same on both of them. So they all have a bond going there. Uh, here we've got a, a single bond between carbon and nitrogen. There we have a double bond. So our hybrid is going to have a partial bond between carbon and nitrogen. And furthermore, uh, positive charge here, no charge there. So we're going to have a partial positive charge on carbon and we will have a partial positive charge on the nitrogen. And so that is our, is our hybrid structure. Again, the hybrid structure is sort of the best of both worlds. Uh, 
uh, and uh, and but it's going to be it's going to uh, the better resonance structure will contribute more to that hybrid structure. All right, here we've got uh, we have a negative charge on the nitrogen and no charge on this oxygen that is adjacent. So our resonance structure that we can do is we can take this and take one of these pairs of electrons and move it in to form a double bond between carbon and nitrogen and kick out the pi bond between carbon and oxygen to put the negative charge out there on the oxygen. Right, and, and we have a negative charge there. Our hybrid structure is going to have uh, all the single bonds there. And uh, let's see, there's still a lone pair there. Uh, it's going to have all the single bonds and then here we have a double bond, there we have a single bond, so we're going to have a partial bond in between the oxygen and carbon, uh, and a partial pi bond between carbon and nitrogen. All right. And then finally, we want to put a partial negative charge on the oxygen and a partial negative charge on the nitrogen. Now, which structure contributes more to the overall structure? Well, because oxygen is more electronegative, uh, this structure is going to contribute more to our, our hybrid structure than that one. So this is our better structure uh, because oxygen is more electronegative. All right, so here uh, we have a special cation that we refer to as an acyl carbonyl. Uh, this is where the carbon is sp hybridized. There is a positive charge on the carbon. Um, there is an empty p orbital on there. And we are going to share electrons from that oxygen to make a triple bond, to make an additional pi bond, which will make a triple bond. That means our resonance structure with oxygen there, and that's going to have a positive charge on the oxygen. So uh, when we look at the hybrid structure, we have a double bond uh, that is in both of them electron pair that's in both of them but now we've got a uh, partial bond in between the two car uh, the carbon and the oxygen and we've got a partial positive charge on the carbon and a partial positive charge on the oxygen as far as which one of these is better it's going to be the one on the right again if we go back to rule two which tells us that the one with a full octet is going to be a better structure this one uh, follows that rule. So this is our better structure, which means uh, uh, because uh, carbon has a full octet. And because of that, um, it's going to contribute more to our hybrid structure uh, than this one does. And that's even though uh, it puts a partial positive charge on the oxygen. All right, we've got one more system here. And it's one more system. Uh, we've got a negative charge and a positive charge. This one's pretty easy. Uh, we're going to take the negative charge and form a pi bond in between this carbon and nitrogen. And when we do that, we'll get a double bond there between carbon and nitrogen. We'll still have a lone pair. Okay. And uh, and then we get uh, we get this. So this is similar to the carbonyl system where we kick out the electrons uh, uh, to make a to put a negative charge onto uh, onto the more electronegative atom because nitrogen is more electronegative. 
However, we'll see a couple of advantages of drawing this resonance structure here. In this resonance structure, we get rid of the charges, so we don't have a positive charge on the carbon, we don't have a negative charge on the nitrogen, and everything has an octet. So this is definitely our better structure. All right. And if you look at, uh, let's see, if you look at rules one, if you look at rules one and uh, two, you will see that, uh, that this is a better structure because one, it has more bonds and fewer charges, and two, uh, uh, two it fills all of our octets. So uh, it's, it's better for a lot of reasons. Let's look at the hybrid structure. All right, so we have a partial a partial bond in between that carbon and nitrogen. And we're going to have a partial negative charge on the nitrogen and a partial positive charge on the carbon. And so this is definitely a better structure, but this does contribute a small amount. What it tells us about this hybrid structure and about the true structure of the molecule is that that carbon has a significant partial positive charge that makes that carbon electrophilic. It's going to seek out electrons. So if we have a nucleophile come in, it could potentially react with that carbon. All right, in this next segment, we're going to look at hybridization and geometry. And this relates to um, this relates to that enolate that I've mentioned a couple of times. There's this resonance stabilized uh, compound that's an enolate. And again, we're going to see that in uh, chapter 21, I think. All right. Well, when we draw the two resonance structures, we've got, we've got conflicting information to talk about what is the hybridization of the carbon that is adjacent to the carbonyl. If we draw this structure, the one on the left, it would appear that that carbon is sp3 hybridized because there are four groups around that carbon. There's three bonds and a lone pair of electrons. Typically when that happens, that's going to be tetrahedral arrangement, 109.5 degrees, sp3 hybridized. But when we draw the resonance structure, uh, we share those electrons uh, to make the carbon-carbon pi bond and we kick out the electrons to this oxygen, which would seem to make the oxygen now sp3 hybridized and the carbon sp2 hybridized. So what is it? Is, is this carbon sp3 or is it sp2? Well, based on structure A, it's sp3. Based on structure B, it's sp2. The answer is, in order for these electrons to be delocalized, they need to be in a p orbital we can't have them in an sp3 orbital. So that means that structure B uh, is going to, or the, the carbon is gonna be sp2 hybridized as structure B would indicate. Again, if we're gonna share those electrons and delocalize them, then they need to be, uh, that needs to be in a p orbital, which means this carbon has to be sp2 hybridized. So the p orbital is required for conjugation. So that electron uh, pair that's adjacent, it only can de be delocalized if it happens to be in a p orbital. So we're going to say that that pair of electrons is in a p orbital, and it's when we uh, it, it's when we share that that we can have it delocalized. So if you have three adjacent p orbitals in the anion, uh, that will make it conjugated. So we want to look at conjugated dienes. And with conjugated dienes, we get some interesting things that happen. So conjugated dienes are compounds that have two double bonds joined by a sigma bond. Uh, an example of a conjugated diene um, uh, is you know, the 1,3-butadiene system. Here we've got uh, additional R groups on there. And when we do that, uh, uh, when we do that, 
we have stereochemistry that is associated with each of these double bonds. So we can look individually at each of these double bonds and determine if that double bond is cis or trans. In this case, this one's trans and this one's trans. So both of those are trans. All right. So with our 1,3-butadiene, that's our simplest conjugated dienes, but if we were to take this, instead of having butadiene, if we were to have um, hexa-2,4-diene, all right, so hexa-2,4-diene, where these are both methyl groups, there are three stereoisomers of that. One of the stereoisomers would happen where they're both trans. One of the stereoisomers would have it, have it where both of, the pi, uh, both of the double bonds are cis, so we've got uh, same side and same side. And then we'd have one of them where one is cis and one is trans. These are, um, these are three stereoisomers that are possible to isolate from each other. They are different compounds with different melting points and different boiling points. They are unique compounds. And, um, and so we need to understand what it is that we refer, uh, that we do to refer to this. Now, back in chapter 10, when we did nomenclature on um, alkenes, we talked about how do we name an alkene if cis-trans isn't enough of a description. And we use the, uh, we use the German words on Gigan and Susamen, uh, uh, where E means trans and Z means cis, so to speak, uh, uh, where the larger groups, according to our, our CIP priority system, is going to be, uh, um, if they're further apart, then we call it E. And if they're closer together, we call it Z. So we can have uh, cis-trans isomerism on both of those, which gives us three possibilities for that kind of, uh, that kind of diene, three stereoisomers. But we also have a situation where we can have different conjugation or different conformations of conjugated dienes. So, for example, in 1,3-butadiene, um, it's possible to have two different conformations. And I am going to show you those two different conformations. I've got, um, I've got a, uh, a model here, and this is the S-trans conformation. And you'll see, arranged like the S-trans is up here, uh, the, the two pi bonds are opposite each other across this sigma bond, and that's what the S is about. It's the sigma. If, um, if we take this compound and rotate it freely, which it can do, we rotate it freely about that carbon-carbon single bond in between carbon-2 and carbon-3, we get the other conformation, which is the S-cis. So this is S-cis, which is the one that is here. I could turn it around so it looks more like what we have there. So, so this is the S cis. And if we take that and flip it over, we get the S trans. So S cis, S trans. And we'll find that this freely rotates around that carbon two, carbon three bond. And it does it uh, dozens, perhaps even hundreds of times per second. Uh, uh, and so it's certainly possible to have both of these conformations. Right. Note, again, these are not stereoisomers. Stereoisomers, you can't just rotate about a bond uh, on a stereoisomer. If it's a stereoisomer, that means it is a discrete molecule. Conformations readily interconvert. It's the same molecule when it's conformations. So, uh, for example, here we've got a cis-cis isomer. Here we've got a trans-trans isomer. Uh, these are stereoisomers of each other. But if we take this stereoisomer, the trans-trans isomer, or EE, if we want to go with that, uh, and rotate about the carbon-3, carbon-4 bond, we can get this. And this is the S-cis conformation of that isomer. So we're going to look at problem number 11 on the in-class assignment. And this... It's a fairly simple problem. 
relatively speaking, but uh, we we want to make sure that we get it. So here we are, we switched over to our document camera, and we've got several different compounds that we want to illustrate here. So we've got 2E4E octa-2,4-diene. So octa-2,4-diene and E means trans, so trans-trans, and it's the S-trans conformation. If everything's trans, if you have trans uh, uh, configurations on your stereochemistry and you have uh, the S-trans, this is really easy to draw. So uh, I'm going to draw octa because it's eight. I'll draw octa. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is carbon one, two. I'll go ahead and label these. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we have double bonds between uh, uh, for the second bond. And we have a double bond uh, for the fourth bond. So one, two, three, four is a double bond here. And so these are trans. This is E. So if you look, uh, carbon one and four are trans to each other. So they're E on Tegan. And uh, carbon three and carbon six are trans to each other. So that one is also E. And this is in the S trans conformation. If it were S cis, we would rotate about that carbon uh, three, carbon four bond. So to do part B, to do part B, we have nonadiene and it's three, five diene. So nonadiene. Uh, and so for this, it's three E five Z. So three E five Z. Now, sometimes people will find that it is just easier um, it is easier if you draw this as if everything's E and then fix it. I prefer not to do that. So I'm going to see if we can draw this uh, and put it into the correct configuration. So I'll say out the carbons as we draw them. So this is carbon one, two, three, and four. Uh, car bond three uh, is E. All right, so we have a double bond there, and it's E. So carbon five and two are going to be trans to each other because it is E. Carbon, uh, uh, so that's carbon five. Carbon six is going to be a pi bond. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and draw it as if it is in the S trans conformation, and then we'll rotate it. So here uh, uh, we're going to have a pi bond in between uh, carbon five and six and there's seven eight uh, and nine we're going to rotate about uh, we're going to rotate about the carbon uh, and I number this so one two three four five six seven eight and nine and you'll notice that on between carbon five and carbon six i put a uh, i made this cis so carbon four and seven are cis to each other because uh carbon five is the z uh, isomer but this is in the s cis arrangement so this is s cis we want it this is i'm sorry this is s trans we want to put it into the S cis conformation. So we're going to rotate about the carbon four, carbon five bond. And when we do that, this is going to rotate down. Now it can be a little bit tricky to draw, but certainly not impossible. So one, two, three, four, five. And so here bond three is a double bond. And here we're going to put our double bond. Now that's uh, that's in the S cis arrangement. This is also a cis uh, double bond. And then so that's seven, eight, nine. So let's go ahead and count these off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You'll see that bond three 
is E, so it's trans, so 2 and 5 are trans to each other. Bond 5, which is between 5 and 6, that one's cis, carbons uh, uh, 4 and 7 are cis to each other. And then we want it in the S cis conformation, meaning that uh, the, the pi bond here and here are S cis. So that is, um, that is that confirmation of that molecule. So this one is S cis. All right, so now we've got a fairly tricky compound to draw here. We've got 3Z, 5Z, so these are both cis, 4,5-dimethyl, deca, 3,5-diene. So, uh, so let's, just, let's just start drawing and see what we can do here. Uh, and we want both S cis and the S trans. We're going to start with the S trans. So carbon one, two, three, four. There's a double bond there. All right. And then five. So this uh, uh, three is Z. So it's cis to each other. So these two are cis. And then a double bond here. All right, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. And then uh, bond five is also cis. So we'll have a, uh, a bond there. So that's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now. Now, let's make sure we have everything. Oh, we need to put the methyl groups on there. So we've got a methyl group on carbon-4. Let me go ahead and label this. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So that's dimethyl deca 35 diene So carbon-carbon double bond at 3 and the 5 positions. Um, there's Z. So this 2 and 5 are cis to each other. Uh, this one's also cis, so 4 and 7 are cis to each other. And then this is in the S uh, trans conformation. And we need to put our methyl groups in there to finish it off. So, um, so that gives us our 4,5-dimethyl part. All right, so again, this is S trans. To do S cis, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, we're going to rotate about this carbon-4, carbon-5 bond. I'm going to leave carbons 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 all exactly where they are. So, double bond there. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then we're going to rotate about this. So this is going to flip over here. So we'll have a methyl there, a double bond there. So that's carbon-3, 2, and one. All right, I'm going to label that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And so that is our S trans, or I'm sorry, S cis confirmation. That's our S cis confirmation. So let's switch over to our presentation. And we're going to look at some interesting dienes. And so interesting dienes, uh, these are some that occur naturally. Um, uh, we're just going to look at a couple here. Isoprene is an important compound that shows up in plants. Um, and uh, plants tend to release these, the isoprene uh, whenever the temperature rises, which is kind of interesting. So here is a picture of isoprene. That isoprene, uh, you'll notice there are five carbons in isoprene. That isoprene is the basis for a whole category of compounds that are called terpenes. Terpenes are compounds that have multiples of isoprene in their structure. Uh, so this isoprene can react with another isoprene to make a terpene, or it can react with two more to make a terpene. So you'll find that terpenes either have, uh, um, they either have 10, uh, 15, 20, 25, 30. They're always multiples of five 
uh, um, carbons that are in the terpenes. And it's a it's an interesting class of molecules. It includes thing it includes lots of essential oils that you probably have heard of. Uh, it includes turpentine. Turpentine is a uh, is a terpene, and it also includes this compound at the bottom, which is lycopene. Lycopene is a compound that uh, uh, shows up in tomatoes and other red uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. And it is what gives tomatoes their distinctive red color. Uh, you can even get um, you can even get supplements that have lycopene in them. It is a it is considered a nutrient. Um, they have lycopene in them, and um, it this particular thing acts as an antioxidant, so it is uh, somewhat beneficial. Uh, you probably get enough lycopene if you if you eat vegetables. So if you eat, even if you just eat catch, ketchup, you're probably getting plenty of lycopene, but uh, you can get supplements for them. And yes, if you break open the supplements, they will be red. Um, so it is a red compound. We're gonna talk about lycopene a little bit later in the chapter when, uh, when we discuss how conjugated systems interact with light. And we'll talk about why this compound is red. So pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to look at one more topic in part one of the video, and then we're going to uh, we're going to stop, and we'll do uh, we'll do the part two. Uh, we'll do the part two video. Uh, we'll start on the next section. So we want to look at um, the bond lengths of the sigma bonds in buta one three diene. So there are, um, and we'll find that when we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about conjugated dienes, there's a couple of things that are unusual about the dienes. There's four features that are unusual. One is that the carbon-carbon single bond that joins the two double bonds is unusually short, right? If we look at a carbon-carbon double bond that is in, um, that is in ethylene, we'll find that it, uh, has a bond length of about 134 picometers, or if you want to do angstroms, 1.34 angstroms. Just depends on what your your favorite unit of, of small lengths is. All right, if we look at the bond length for the carbon-carbon sigma bond uh, in ethane, it is 153 picometers, so significantly longer. So, and th and this makes sense because uh, double bonds tend to be shorter and stronger than single bonds. Well, if we look at the carbon-carbon sigma bond in between carbon two and carbon three in, in butadiene, we will find that um, it has a bond length of 148. So it definitely acts like a sigma bond. It's def there's free rotation, as we've seen, there's free rotation about that sigma bond, but um, it's not as long as a typical uh, single bond. So we're gonna look at why that is, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Now, another feature that distinguishes di uh, conjugated dienes from isolated dienes is that conjugated dienes are more stable than similar isolated dienes. We'll talk about that here in a future section. In a few, it'll be in the next video. The third thing is that there are certain reactions that we do with conjugated dienes that give us different results than we would get with the isolated dienes. And for one example of that is electrophilic addition, and we'll talk about what happens there. And then the final thing, and this is the thing that we're gonna talk about at the end of the next video, is uh, that conjugated dienes absorb longer wavelengths of ultraviolet light. And that's why, that's why the lycopene, it absorbs so far uh, um, so so much longer wavelength that it actually absorbs in the visible part of the spectrum. So, all right, so let's get back to this. Uh, one. Why is this true? Why is it that this carbon-carbon single bond in butadiene is shorter than the carbon-carbon single bond in this? There's two reasons. The first reason has to do with hybridization. 
when we look at the hybridization of the carbons in ethane, uh, they are sp3 hybridized. And when we look at the carbons uh, 2 and 3 here in uh, butadiene, they are sp2 hybridized. Well, we know that sp3 hybridized orbitals are longer than sp2 hybridized orbitals because they have more p character and less s character. S, s orbitals are spherical and kind of small. P orbitals are kind of elongated. So when it has sp3 when it has sp3, there's less s character, so it's longer. With the sp2, it is a it's going to make shorter bonds because the orbitals are shorter. So when we have the 1,3 butadiene, uh, it has more s character in that 1,3 butadiene and the sp2 hybridized carbons, and therefore our carbon uh, two carbon three bond is going to be shorter than a comparable single bond in an sp3 hybridized carbons. We can extend this, uh, and we'll do that on number 13. So let's look at our document camera here. And so using hybridization, we want to predict how the bond lengths of the carbon-carbon single bond in, and this one is uh, butadiene. So we've got a 1,3-diene, all right? So these carbons are sp hybridized. Uh, and then the bond length, the carbon-carbon bond length in, uh, in ethane and the carbon-carbon bond length in uh, butadiene. All right, on this, we just have to think about the hybridization. The more S character, the shorter the bond. So uh, these are SP hybridized. That's gonna have 50% S character. So these are gonna have the shortest bond. So our shortest bond, uh, sigma bond here, it's gonna be so hydrogen, carbon, triple bond, carbon, and then I'm going to indicate this bond in red. So there's a single bond there. And then carbon, triple bond, carbon, hydrogen. So this is our shortest. Uh, sig the shortest single bond that we're referring to. And it's because it is a carbon SP hybridized, carbon SP hybridized. And that's our sigma bond there. All right. So now let's look at the next one. The next one is going to be the one that's sp2 hybridized. So it'll be the butadiene that we refer to. So uh, CH2 double bond CH. And again, I'm going to draw this one in red to indicate that that's the one that we're talking about. That one's going to be longer than this one. And then CH double bond CH2. And this one will be in the middle and it is a sigma carbon sp2 carbon sp2 and we'll just put it is in the middle and then our longest bond is going to be ch3 again i'll use red to indicate that single bond there and that is going to be a uh, in the longest And that is a sigma carbon sp3 carbon sp3. So the more s character it has, the shorter it is. And the less s character it has, the longer it is. So shortest, middle, longest. Now, before we stop, I want to switch back over. We're going to do one more page on the presentation and then uh, and then we'll pick up with the next uh, video uh, in the next section. So we're going to look at another argument for why that carbon two carbon three bond in butadiene is shorter. And we, the argument that we can use is a resonance structure argument. And I like this argument, although the other one is perfectly valid. Um, they're both arguments, they're both ways of understanding it. Uh, if we look at the resonance structures for 1,3-butadiene or buta-1,3-diene, uh, our, our primary resonance structure is going to be where we have the isolated 
uh, as, uh, pi bonds between carbon one and two and three and four. However, we know that there is, these are conjugated, so there is some significant overlap. And the way that we can represent that overlap is drawing the two additional resonance structures. One where we put a positive charge on carbon one, uh, put the pi bond between carbon two and three, and a negative charge on carbon four. The other resonance structure is going to be the exact opposite, where we put the negative charge on carbon one, uh, a pi bond in between carbon two and three, and a positive charge on carbon four. Well, these positive and negatives end up canceling each other out. And so our overall hybrid structure is just going to have some partial double bond character between carbon two and carbon three. Since we know that, uh, since we know that double bonds are shorter and stronger than single bonds, uh, it would make sense that this bond is going to be shorter than a typical carbon-carbon uh, sigma bond, single bond. Uh, because it has some double bond character. And that is our resonance structure argument for understanding why the carbon-2, carbon-3 bond in butadiene is a little bit shorter than a typical carbon-carbon sigma bond. So you can pick which one you like more. Do you like the resonance argument or do you like the hybridization argument? And if you ask me which one is the right answer, I would say yes.